Yes, yeah, so welcome to our Nature Connections webinar series from the Camel Valley uh, Nature House. So thanks everybody for joining us today. And I am Jeff Roten. I am with uh, Metro Vancouver Regional Parks. Um, this webinar series is graciously hosted by Pacific Parklands Foundation. So right now, um, I'd like to introduce their executive director, Jen and Antonio, to say a few words about the foundation. So um, first of all, I'd like to start by acknowledging that the Nature House is on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish First Nations. And I wish to extend my appreciation for the opportunity to hold this webinar on their shared traditional territories. Um, as well, I wanna thank Jeff and the Camel Valley Nature House and Tamsin for, from the um, South Coast Conservation, Conservation Program for partnering us with us today. It's fantastic. I love the chance to, uh, maybe we're not getting together, but at least we're able to show the, share the passion that we have for nature. The Pacific Parklands Foundation was founded 20 years ago. And um, our sole goal is to support Metro Vancouver Regional Parks, and we hope to connect people with nature and help protect our parks. And so this is a great way to do it. And I'm really looking forward to learning a lot today. Um, and um, I would just turn it over to you, Jeff. Thank you. Okay, so for those of you who haven't been there, the Nature House um, is in Campbell Valley Regional Park, and that's in South Langley in Metro Vancouver. Um, and it's currently housed in that beautiful um, red heritage barn that you see in the photo there. And it has interactive exhibits and displays for the whole family. And it would normally have a regular drop-in hours during the summer season, and today would be one of the days where it would be open but it's currently closed during COVID-19 and we don't know um, if it'll reopen this summer at all, unfortunately. So we thought we'd take the opportunity to offer webinars to feature some of our, the local organizations that typically um, have guest displays and presentations at the Nature House. Wonderful, well, thank you so much for having me here today. Thanks for everyone for dropping in to learn about species at risk. Um, just want to thank the Campbell Valley Nature House and the Pacific Parklands Foundation and Metro Vancouver Parks for putting on this series. And uh, yeah, so I'm just going to get into it here. Um, today I'm going to talk about the species at risk on BC's south coast. And this is uh, what I'm going to talk about today. This is, uh, I'm going to give a quick introduction to the South Coast Conservation Program. Some of you may not have heard of who we are. And then I'm going to jump into what exactly we mean when we say uh, something's a species at risk. Uh, then I'm going to talk about some examples of local species at risk. And then uh, the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk about ways to help, um, mostly ways that people, um, anyone can help um, on their properties um, and how to be a, a good nature steward. And I'll wrap up with um, everything I'm talking about is uh, found online. I'll, I'll direct you to where you can get uh, that information and more. Okay, so the uh, South Coast Conservation Program, we've been around since 2006, and we're a multi-partner group um, made up of a whole variety of organizations, uh, federal government, provincial government, um, academia, so like UBC, uh, NGOs, First Nations, uh, anyone, who's, a lot of people who work on issues around uh, or protecting species at risk uh, in the region. And our group was formed to help coordinate and facilitate um, projects and activities to uh, restore and protect species and ecosystems at risk. And uh, now you're probably wondering what I mean when I say South Coast. Uh, this is the area that I'm talking about here that we cover. Um, it's quite, this is, uh, consists of five different regional districts. So way up to the Powell River area, to the uh, lower the Sunshine Coast Regional District, the Sea to Sky area, Metro Vancouver, and into the the Fraser Valley. And this area, I'm sure you're all very familiar. Um, we live in an area that has a whole range of habitats, from the ocean, the rivers, um, streams, wetlands, mountainsides, forests, grasslands. We got a bit of everything here, and that really means we have a high level of biodiversity. And there are about uh, 60 species at risk um, that are listed in this region. Uh, I will not be talking about all 60 today. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna pick a few and I'll focus on those, but it's a pretty special area that we live in with lots of different in, uh, habitats and a lot of cool critters. 
And OK, so then I'm going to talk about um, what do I mean when I say species at risk? And this is what the uh, SCCP and others um, sort of uh, consider as species at risk. And I'm going to talk about some of the reasons why the threats behind um, why some species are, are considered at risk in this region. And uh, so I'm going to talk about um, sort of how species are considered, like how they're ranked. Um, and I'm going to start from a provincial perspective. Um, so in British Columbia, uh, essentially, who decides what is at risk in BC? And it's about experts um, identifying levels of threat for different species and ecosystems, and that they look at the data, and it's usually it's the through the provincial government's BC Conservation Data Center, and they will determine, um, looking at, at the information that they know, whether species are red, blue, or yellow listed. And I'm sure many of you out there have heard of um, red listed species, blue listed species. And um, so that's where this comes from is, is this is um, there, it's an indicator list that, that sort of is to guide and to show where experts think how these species are doing in BC. This uh, listing system uh, has no legal um, protection behind it. It's really, as I say, it's for guidance. Um, it is very helpful. And uh, so red, red listed um, means either extirpated, meaning they're no, no longer in BC endangered or threatened. Um, blue listed means a uh, species is of special concern, so there's reasons to be concerned that its populations aren't doing as well. And yellow means that the data indicates the species are not currently at risk. Um, so in the, the pictures down below, uh, that bird to the left is a, a horned lark. It's a strigata subspecies that used to be here on the coast um, and is no longer here in BC uh, on the coast region. So it's extirpated um, from BC. And then in the middle, you've got grizzly bears um, and that those are um, considered blue listed. And then the other interesting thing about the BC Conservation Data Center is they actually will list ecosystems. So different combinations of plant communities um, and, and designate them. So this picture to the right is of a coastal sand ecosystem. And so this is a really unique combination of plants that are, uh, have been evolved to adapt and they survive in this really harsh condition. And that's considered a red listed plant community. Um, and then, okay, so then before we go forward, um, I, we got this great feature within webinars, we can do a quiz. So I'm gonna ask uh, Jeff to throw out my first series of questions. My first question, sorry. Jeff, if you're um, able to, to do and that. And that's the invasive species? No, that's the... The species no longer found, okay, yeah. Yes, yeah. So this okay. is a, a test for you guys. This is going to be, this is a list of... Okay. Yeah, so which of these species are no longer found in BC? What do you guys think? So again, so just click on your answer. Which one's extirpated? Okay, we people. people are deciding. Okay. okay. There's some interesting, you might recognize what these species are, hopefully, some of you. Okay, so Maybe. burring owl or northern goshawk, is it, how do you say it, goshawk? Nor northern goshawk. Dog, western pond okay. turtle, rubber boa. That's a snake. Okay, okay. I'm going to give people a couple more seconds, I think. A couple mm -hmm. more seconds, click on your answer. I think that's probably it. Okay. Okay, see if you got it right. Okay, and here are the results here. Results. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> so tw I know I, this is a 20% uh, of you got it right. The Western pond turtle um, is no longer found here. We only have one native species of turtle, it's the Western tainted turtle. Um, yeah, but the rubber boa, that's interesting you guys uh, thought of that because you wouldn't think we would have, you know, that we have boas here. And the answer is yes, actually. Um, and, but they are very hard to find, very elusive. Um, they're at risk for a reason. <laughs> um, but I was talking to, I, I have a project, a, a program I run, which I'll talk about later, where I, I visit landowners. And I was out in the Chulak River Valley area yesterday and a landowner was telling me she'd seen them in the area, not recently, but, but there. So uh, I've had hopefully confirmation they're still, still around. And anyway, so yeah, that, that was interesting. Thanks guys. Okay, uh, so we're gonna keep moving on here. And uh, okay, so now we're gonna get into, we're gonna just 
touch on some of the, the legalities of a species of risk. So you're probably wondering, okay, what does it mean? And they're listed. Um, so BC protects species under several acts. Um, and the only one I'm going to touch on today is the BC Wildlife Act. Um, and under the BC Wildlife Act, they, are, they have designated um, only a handful of species are actually officially listed as, um, as at risk. And those, the three, the ones that are endangered are the burrowing owl, American white pelican, and the Vancouver Island marmots, of which this is a little a picture of. Uh, the sea otters listen, listed as threatened. And that's it. Um, there are obviously a lot more species that are considered at risk, but they're not part of the act yet. So that's something that would be nice to update or change in some shape or form. Um, the other part of the act I wanted to also mention to you all is it does protect birds' nests and their eggs. So specifically, it mentions the nests of the eagle, peregrine falcon, jeer falcon, osprey, heron, or burring owl. And that the act protects the actual nests, whether the birds are in them or using them or not. Um, so that's also a handy um, thing that, that the act has. So that's uh, some more legally um, how our species are listed in BC. So that's uh, just touching on where things are at the province. And then I'm going to talk about uh, species. We are very interested um, with the SCCP and, and how species are listed um, in Canada federally. And uh, there is a organization called the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, or known as CASIWIC. And that is uh, where a series of experts get together and they will designate where they, how they think species are in terms of their level of risk. Um, and then uh, in 2002, I believe, the um, federal government enacted the Species at Risk Act, we call it SARA, and they have a list of species, that's where species are officially listed under what's called Schedule 1. Um, and so they will look at what's recommended by CASIWIC and then list them officially under SARA. Um, but just because something's list designated under CASIWIC from the experts doesn't always necessarily mean the listing matches with Sarah. There's sometimes a bit of a lag between the two, although that the difference is getting smaller and smaller. So that's something to keep in mind. And then, so when a species is listed uh, under Sarah, so the different categories are very similar to what um, you saw with the province. They're listed either as endangered, where they're facing imminent extirpation or extinction. They can be threatened, uh, where they're likely to become endangered if things do not change. Um, and if a species is listed as endangered or threatened, then uh, a team of experts will create what's called a recovery strategy, a detailed document that will, should also map the areas where these species need to survive. And by the areas, it means it's called critical habitat, and it has to do with these areas that might have the biophysical attributes needed for these species to survive. And this map I have here is of the Fraser Valley. It shows a bit of Sumas Mountain and Chilliwack Mountain um, and Vedder Mountain and just shows different polygons and areas that have been uh, identified as um, critical habitats. And it doesn't mean that, that those areas are protected. It just means they should be looked at to, have to see if they have features um, regarding um, the keeping these, these species to help them survive. So that's, that's when, uh, so then recovery strategies are created, but then the other category, the third one is if they're listed as special concern, uh, meaning that these species, um, there's certain characteristics we're worried that make them sensitive to becoming uh, threatened or endangered. In that case, a management plan is created, but no critical habitat is officially identified. Uh, other categories I've mentioned extirpated, not at risk, and then data deficient, um, just also want to mention that there's actually a lot of information we don't know about a lot of species and sometimes we just don't have the, enough data to know where to uh, list them or if they need to be listed at all. Okay, so that is um, sort of what it means to be a species at risk and then now I'm going to talk a bit about what are the threats that um, make us concerned about them and this map here showing the lower mainland is a great example of, you know, space is tight. You know, habitat loss is a real threat, be it from development, agriculture, roads, anything. Um, losing habitat means losing species. And our area, as you know, is only, continue, only continuing to grow. Uh, its population is only continuing to grow. Um, so that's a significant threat. 
The next one, which, um, so, and then also this is just, this slide is to illustrate uh, how much habitat has been lost over the years. Um, the region, the Metro Vancouver Fraser Valley region used to be covered in wetlands. This map, especially in the, the blue color, shows the historical wetlands from the 1800s. And then if uh, click, I think you'll see the change as to what's been lost. And this is what is roughly mapped as to what remains today. So to show the, the change uh, of habitat loss over time. And then, okay, another threat, a significant threat is uh, invasive species. And I'm sure a lot of you recognize these pictures here. Um, they can create monocultures, uh, wipe out other species, and uh, <coughs> they outcompete um, the, the native species. So, and we'll talk a bit more about that uh, a bit later. Okay, and the other sort of threats I wanted to mention um, are cute and cuddly pets, uh, cats, unfortunately, when they're let outside can be quite, um, they, they do like to hunt, uh, even if they're fed nicely, they still catch birds and rodents and, <coughs> excuse me, they can, um, so when everyone, everyone's cats is outdoors, they can make a real dent in the biodiversity. So we try and encourage people to keep their cats indoors. Um, and then with climate change is another issue. Um, as things get warmer, a lot of this, and, um, a species uh, can't adapt to those habitat, the, the temperature changes um, and the habitat changes, they can't adapt fast enough. So that also can lead to, to issues with their populations. Okay, so those are some sort of summary of, of main threats there. And then, uh, so now I'm gonna talk about a few of the 60 species at risk here on the South Coast. Now, we don't have cute and cuddly pandas, but we do have a nice array of what I think are pretty cute, adorable critters that we all care about here. And uh, the first one I'm gonna talk about is, uh, this is one I got involved in years ago, is the uh, Pacific water shrew. This is a federally endangered shrew that's found in only about 25 locations here, just in Canada, here on the South Coast. Um, like shrews, it's got a little pointy nose um, and sort of uh, velvet fur. Um, it's, as it name, its name suggests, it likes to live in and around water. It's a voracious hunter uh, in the water, eating bugs and slugs and snails. And, and um, then on land, it likes to make nests in, uh, in rotting wood. And uh, here's a sort of picture of its cute little feet. Um, it has these little stiff hairs on the back of its feet, so it allows it to, uh, to hold tight when it's scrambling around all the slippery rocks. And also these hairs can trap air bubbles. And these little uh, shrews have been known to, they can run across water. Uh, so if you think you see a little shrew zipping across the water, uh, you might be right. You might be seeing a, a, a Pacific water shrew. And so they're pretty, but they're, they're, we, they may be hard to see, but there are reasons to why we need to protect our waterways, wetlands, and the adjacent riparian habitats as well. Okay, and then uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, amphibians at risk. And uh, before I do that, uh, Jeff, I have another question for everyone. I wonder if we could do that one next. Okay, and yeah. that is the amphibian one. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so um, thinking of all of our amphibians here, which native ones are you most likely to hear calling? Which ones do you hear the most, the native species? Okay, give people a few okay. seconds to, a few seconds to answer here. Interesting. Okay. Let's see. Let's just wait. Uh, Another second here. Is that everybody? I guess everybody has voted here. Oh, okay. there we go. One more. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to end the polling now. Did you guys um, know you're frogs? Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so 30% of you got it right. Um, the Northern Pacific tree frog is the ones that have the big chorus calls 
uh, you hear in the spring, the mating calls. They have another, they used to have another name known as the chorus, they're Pacific chorus frogs. Um, so I didn't want to, this is a new name, they just changed the name, so I thought this would be a little tricky. Um, and uh, yeah, they're the, pretty much the only native ones you're going to hear. Um, Western toads do make a bit of noise sometimes, especially if they're harassed. <laughs> they, then they do call, they have a calling, but it's not that loud. I, or I, I don't think you're quite, not as likely to, to hear them. Um, and uh, I don't believe Northwestern salamanders make any noise. I don't know. That's a, I'm going to have to ask someone about that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, northern red-leggeds call underwater. So that's uh, mostly. And, and so speaking of northern red-leggeds, um, this is the first amphibian at rest I'll just mention. This is a species of special concern. Um, they've got that sort of eye mask and um, the sort of fold down the back. Um, they're ones that they, they live mostly in the forest, but then they, uh, like most amphibians, they will migrate to various water sources or what, like ponds and wetlands to breed in the spring. And as I said, they are native species of amphibians. They're the ones who breed earlier in the year. Uh, so they're actually, these ones are one of the first species to actually uh, breed, uh, usually as early as February. So um, you might see uh, eggs in the water uh, as early as February, it could be these guys. Okay, and then uh, I'm going to talk about the western toad for a minute. This is our only native toad. It's also a special concern. Um, they're, they're like little Arnold Schwarzenegger frogs or toads. They got this warty look. Uh, they have this really uh, a noticeable line down their back. Um, and they're known, they again also live in forests and they migrate to the same wetlands every year to breed. Um, and they're known because they breed a lot of eggs and then their little ba the baby toads, the toadlets, they all emerge en masse and migrate uh, together um, later in the, the summer. Like, and now they're starting in some areas. Um, and there these you may so you may hear uh, news stories about toadlets crossing roads and there's a toad tunnel was created in Chilliwack to help them cross the road in one area so that was the Fraser Valley Conservancy so these little guys are so you might hear stories about those and then um but are these all the frogs uh, at risk uh, or they're not um uh, the other one to mention is the Oregon spotted frog the most endangered frog in Canada there's a picture there in the bottom right and uh, they can be confused a bit with red-legged frogs but they are quite rare they like to live in shallow uh, wetlands um, we also have coastal tailed frogs they have little tails um, they're only found in fast moving mountain streams um, so those are the other two at-risk species and i mentioned um, we do have the northern pacific tree frog that's the one you hear the most it's not at risk but i mean i certainly hear a lot of stories of people saying they used to hear them and then they don't anymore so it I hope as long as we protect their habitat, the wetlands and forests, that uh, they will not become at risk. Uh, threats to these guys too, there are invasive frogs in the area. Um, you probably heard of the American bullfrog uh, and then the green frog as well. And those are uh, two that are taking over. So I so recommend that you know never ever move frogs, frog eggs, um, keep them in place. You don't want to be spreading um, invasive species accidentally or spread disease as well. Uh, another uh, amphibian is the coastal giant salamander. Um, they are threatened in Canada, the largest salamander, and they're only, only found in the Chilliwack River watershed. Um, they have two different, some of them just stay in the water, others will then uh, evolve to stay on land. Um, I've heard these guys can make a noise that they possibly can bark a bit, but I've never heard it, but you know, so maybe there's another vocal, uh, amphibian that vocalizes as well. Okay, and then uh, moving on to snails, we also, uh, there is the Oregon forest snail, a large land snail that lives here um, across the different populations across the Fraser Valley, Lower Mainland. Um, it's federally listed as endangered, and it's found mostly in areas with stinging nettle and big leaf maple. And uh, we have a guide I can show you later on how to identify snails so you can keep an eye out for them yourself. And, uh, and then we're talking a bit about birds. Um, everyone loves owls. And uh, one species at risk for owls is the Western screech owl, which is currently listed as threatened. Uh, these owls, you know, back in the 70s, I mean, they were found all over the lower mainland. Um, but in the past, you know, 30, 40 years, 
their their numbers have just dropped precipitously um, through various reasons, possibly habitat loss, um, the uh, barred owls moving in, which um, are some more aggressive owls. And uh, now they're only really found in a, in a small handful of areas in, in the south coast. Um, they do not screech. Uh, <laughs> you, ever, you should go online and listen to what they sound like. Their call sounds more like a bit of a bouncing ball. Um, this, the owls that do screech are um, barn owls, which I'll talk about in just a second too. Um, and I just want to mention too that when it comes to uh, birds at risk, um, some people are surprised to hear the great blue heron, the populations we have here on the coast are considered at risk. Um, our heron populations live here year round. Um, I'm sure many of you know that they sometimes will nest in large colonies, um, not always. Um, sometimes they, they'll just nest they'll, in a, with a series of a few nests. But um, these species, their um, breeding success has really dropped a lot since the 70s. And so there's sort of an interesting trend. We're concerned about them. Um, they're listed as special concern. Uh, we're worried they might become threatened, but their populations seem to be doing okay at the moment. Um, but their, their threats can be things like eagles, uh, which, whose numbers have gone up. And also um, sometimes their colonies are very sensitive to disturbance around them. So if they're not used to noise and someone you know, fires up a chainsaw that can cause the, the young, the birds in the nest um, to abandon the, the nest. So that's the, you probably, I'm sure you guys have seen them everywhere. Um, they're quite common in the, in the region. And then just to wrap up with birds, um, you know, barn owl is also another species at risk uh, as uh, the various barns get torn down. Um, and uh, then barn swallows as well are uh, at birds that they're little birds that eat insects and insectivore uh, those birds are populations are been not doing so well um, so one thing we're trying to encourage people to do is when they have barn swallow nests on the side of, of buildings is so they can make a real mess and sometimes people will just knock them down but we're trying to, to encourage people to um, keep those nests um, and enjoy that you have barn swallows and let them survive survive there because they're um, not, not nearly as many as there used to be um, several years ago. Okay, and then uh, it's not all about uh, birds and amphibians. It's also, uh, we are involved in plants at risk. I just wanted to mention the phantom orchid, which is a really cool uh, plant that's listed as endangered. As you can see this, from this photo, it lacks chlorophyll and depends on a symbiotic relationship with a fungus for nutrition. And it smells a bit like vanilla. Um, this is a pretty rare plant that you'd be pretty hard pressed to find. It needs a very certain special combination of conditions for it to grow and it doesn't grow every year as well. So um, it's unfortunately not one we can just grow in a nursery and plant elsewhere. We really need to protect its habitat and it is mostly found uh, in the Fraser Valley but also I believe on uh, some Gulf Islands too. Okay, and then, uh, so that's sort of my quick, uh, you know, talking about various species. Um, are those all the species at risk? No, they're not. Uh, as I mentioned, there's, there's definitely a lot more. Um, but one thing I wanted to, to mention and sort of throw out there too is that, you know, there's still, as I said, there's a lot we don't know and we're still finding new populations. Um, and, you know, if you think you see something interesting, take a photo. Um, you know, I'm always interested in if you ever want to send it to me, I can help identify it, especially if it's a, a frog or a snail. Um, and then also there are ways to report, iNaturalist is becoming a really neat app um, to record what you find when you're out there in the wilderness uh, or in, in, in nature. Uh, I, I, and there are different, uh, so it's, an, it's a nice way to record what you see and, and identify it as well. Okay. Great, so uh, now I'm the next, the final part of my presentation is how to be a nature steward. You know, how can you help wildlife and species at risk uh, in, in this region? And uh, so the first thing I want to mention is, you know, I touched on it before, is identifying and controlling invasive species. Um, so what are invasive species? Well, they're non-native um, species, plants and animals that are introduced to a new area and nothing naturally um, is there to keep them under control. And they can be harmful in many different ways to not just humans, but animals and ecosystems. Um, this is a picture of a very big bullfrog when they'll eat pretty much anything they can get into their mouth. So <laughs> um, 
I'm definitely a bit concerned about them. And uh, so then also I've got this slide again of different um, invasive plants. Again, I'm sure you recognize uh, some of these species. You have lamium uh, on the top left, you know, ivy, uh, knotweed, Himalayan balsam, uh, scotch broom, uh, Himalayan blackberry, periwinkle. Uh, those are just sort of the a few that we come across a lot. Um, so trying to keep those under control is, is important. And, uh, and then the next um, tip that we're, we talk about a lot is naturescaping or nature-friendly landscaping, which can mean gardening with native plants and also adding wildlife-friendly features. Um, this is a picture of a guide um, that we created uh, that can help a list a bunch of unique ideas and want to get started on native plant gardening. This is a great local guide that we created. Uh, and in it, we have a nice table with 40 options. So just something that you can, a resource for you to look at um, later on. So I will not dwell on this right now, but uh, it's a very handy, handy guide uh, with, with a corresponding pictures of each of the, the species. So you're going to share the link to that uh, later? You, I just want to make sure it's in the list. Yeah, because I yeah, think absolutely. it'll be interested people. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Well, and actually, uh, so Jeff, I was going to say, since I got this open here, I'm going to actually go to the next slide. Um, can you put up the last uh, question? Sure. Last trivia question. OK. Uh, there we go. OK, so because we just talked about which one of these is not an invasive species. So, we've so do your answer. Yeah. Okay, interesting. I'll give people a few seconds. Just click on the answer. Should be on your screen. False lily of the valley, yellow flag iris, Himalayan blackberry, or English ivy. Which one is not an invasive species? Okay, I'm going to give people a few more seconds. Is that everybody finished answering? Yeah. No, there we go. So people are still deciding. Okay, yeah. Okay. okay. Just click on the one that you think is correct and then hit submit. Okay. Uh, there we go. I think that's it. Okay. Okay, let's see what we've and got. And there we go. Hey, great. Uh, okay, well, we have a tie here. Um, okay. So the first one, false lily the valley, is a native uh, species. The, the rest are invasive. Um, and uh, yeah, yellow flag iris is not what I mentioned, but uh, oh, that's a, it's, it's a really nasty invasive plant. It's, it's, it's beautiful with a, this beautiful yellow um, flower, but it will just choke out the side of ponds and wetlands. Um, and it's, when, it, when it gets a hold, it's very difficult to get rid of. So um, if those of you that have ponds or along streams or anything, keep an eye out for it. And if you try and nip it in the bud if you do get it, uh, one quick way is uh, the, I guess the, the seed pods will be forming soon. You can just cut those to at least stop more seeds from forming. So but anyways, that's, uh, yeah, great. And yeah, uh, good, excellent, thank you. Okay. Okay, okay so uh, just touching base a bit more on why to garden with native plants. Uh, obviously they're adapted to the region, so they make gardening easier. You don't have to do as much work. Um, they also obviously provide excellent food and shelter for wildlife. I mean, our species, our native species have evolved to um, use these plants. So they're the perfect uh, supermarket for, for our local wildlife. And also, I think a lot of them are very attractive as well. They're great gardening options. Um, the one with the pink flowers is red flowering currant, which is one of my favorites and it can attract uh, hummingbirds. It's a great shrub to choose from. And then uh, Red Odoo owes your dogwood there. That one is great. Um, well, it looks nice in the, in the springtime and summer, but in the winter when it loses its leaves, it has these nice red um, branches as well. So it adds a bit of color in the, in the winter time too. And then just a few more pictures of other native plants. Um, Kinnikinix is a great low growing plant. Um, you know, maybe instead of ivy. <laughs> uh, False Solomon seal is a nice one to have on the edge of gardens. And then if you like roses, we have the Nootka rose, which is the, a native uh, rose that looks wonderful and smells great too. Uh, and then, but if you are thinking of creating a native plant garden, um, 
try to maybe instead of just picking individual plants, you might want to try to create a bit of an ecosystem and think about what you want to create. Do you want to create a forest? Um, so think about what goes well in a forest, uh, what are good shade tolerant plants, or if you want something a little more shrubby, um, choose, you can choose shrubs of varying heights and different flowering times and fruiting times. So that provides um, different foods for different species across the seasons. And then just the other point to make too is that um, like I mentioned, you know, habitat is so important, but what's better than just a bit of habitat is a lot of habitat. And it's nice to have connections with other natural areas. So, you know, it's also good to, um, you know, so the, the bigger the area, the better. If you can connect to a parkland, that's great. Or convince your neighbors to also plant native plants is a good idea as well. So think about connections that are frogs and others need to, um, you know, move especially even though yeah frogs need to move from like the forest to the wetlands helps if they don't have to cross a big open area of lawn and then uh, consider creating complexity you can add you know water features are great for birds and pollinators uh, rocks are good for things like reptiles snakes um, and uh, we have northern alligator lizards uh, rubber boas <laughs> um, and yeah so just you want to you, you can and make it messy a bit, um, you know, things like if you have trees that die, uh, let them rot in place provided it's safe. And that provides a lot of habitat for nesting birds. Um, if you're cleaning up your garden, you can leave brush piles that provides good habitat and leaving logs to rot on the ground is great too. Amphibians like salamanders love it um, and they will hide and live um, in rotting logs. So there's a lot of different ways that you can, things you can do um, in your backyard to help our, our wildlife. And then uh, just to sort of getting to wrap up here, I was gonna mention um, the program that I run in conjunction with the Fraser Valley Conservancy is we have our Nature Stewards program, where if you have a property with wildlife habitat, we will come visit, um, give you advice, free advice on how to make it better for wildlife. And that's mostly in the Fraser Valley right now. Um, so if you're interested um, in possibly uh, the program, email me and I will send you some more information. Uh, and then I've talked a lot about different species. Um, we've created these species identification guides to help you when you're out there and you see something and you want to know what it is. Um, so we have our frogs guide, our salamander guides, um, amphibian eggs, owls, and snails. And those are all, uh, they're all online as well, and some other resources as well, just to, um, there's so much information out there, this just leads, these documents lead you to various links where you can get more information. Um, and then, yeah, so then, our, so obviously our website is a great place to go get information. Um, that's our website address. And there's, we have a tab, um, it's called Nature Stewards. If you click on that, um, there'll be some drop downs. Uh, that's where you'll find the identification guides, our plant guides, um, and links to tons. The whole, um, the, the website itself is full of information about all these species I talked about and lots of documents and yeah, fun things to read. So highly recommend you go have a look. Uh, we're on Facebook, so you can follow us there. And then if you have any questions beyond today, um, that's my email there at the bottom. So, and with that, I believe I am, that is my presentation. <laughs> so that's that, that's questions. fantastic. So we're gonna leave that up on the screen. So, um, and Tamsin can take some questions. Now somebody, um, Ray already asked about what is the name of the national body and the name of the list? I'm not sure what list he's talking about. I think, can you, um, Maybe you can uh, answer that. I think you mentioned that briefly before. Yeah, the CASIWIC, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, is that, that was one, they, they provide the designation. And then under the Species at Risk Act, or SARA, um, if you go to, they have a website, the federal government has a website, they call it the SARA Registry. And there you will find the species listed under Schedule One, and um, that a lot of uh, the federal government's information is uh, very much uh, all the recovery plans, critical habitat information, a lot of the stuff you can find under the Sarah Registry website. And Kasiwik was, I'll type that in in the chat box, but it was yeah. C O S E W I C. Yes, yeah, yeah, C O S E W I C. 
W uh, whoops. Oh, okay. that oh, oh, we me. just oh we just lost something. That's there. me. All right. Sorry. That's all right. Well, now it's just you on the screen. Okay. <laughs> Is that all right. Um, <laughs> well, I can. Uh... Okay, I'm just gonna put that. So. Um, Okay, does anybody else have any other questions or comments? Oops, oh, there we go. I'm, I'm putting back. it back, I'm putting it back. <laughs> there we go, great, there, okay. Current slide, there we go. Okay, anyways, yes. <laughs> okay, any other questions from anybody? Does, it, has um, anyone seen any of these species or? Okay, wait, I think I have another question okay. here. Let me, no. That was wrong. Okay, so I'm going to dismiss. Let me go. Um, okay, I actually have one question. And, um, you know, because they talk about, there we go, beautiful. Um, they, you know, they talk about not trimming your, um, trimming back your plants um, in the winter time for, you know, because for the animals, whatever, um, provides habitat during the winter. Uh, I mean, I'm always confused, so I leave most of my stuff up, but I don't know at what point, um, at what point can you actually trim it back? Like, I, you know, there's a point where you've got new growth and you've got this old growth and you need to sort of cut it back. And I'm always worried that I'm cutting it too early. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess what I'm, what we're always concerned about is sort of, is, is a, a species that are being, yeah, disturbed. Um, so you want to avoid the the bird the nesting season I guess is the main uh, which is you know it's more in the the spring and and, and summer um, so in terms of yeah otherwise in, um, it's okay to it, I, I don't think there's an issue in um, cutting it um, you know normal pruning time as long as it's outside the nesting window it okay. should be fine yeah this is more uh, the lower shrubs they talk about not cutting not so much tree pruning but the the smaller shrubs so it would be more for I don't know whether it's could. Um, I forget. I'm not a very good biologist. Is it like, you know, butterflies or, you know, whatever's nesting in the, some of the smaller um, shrubs? Yeah, well, mostly on the shrub, and that would be, I guess, that uh, we're more concerned, I guess, about, yeah, birds uh, nesting. It's sort okay. of one, so it one is main, bird. okay. Yeah, but it, it, well, so that's more the, the biggest issue. I mean, otherwise, um, I mean, you don't want to try to think of what other nests and things might, might be in there. Um, but yeah, sometimes because always plants can really get out of control too. You do have to get in and do a bit of pruning, yeah. <laughs> and that's fine. Just uh, so I, yeah. I do have a couple, a few other questions here. So one is, do your site list locations like Pacific Shrew at Burnaby Lake? Uh, yeah, I think they they've been found around there. Okay, and um, another is so um, so. Does your site does it actually list locations where some of these might be found then? The, if you, uh, so that's when you could look at the recovery strategy um, <clears throat> for this species. So if you, if you go to the, the Sarah registry website and find the, the Pacific water shrew, you know, the page, um, the document, it, you can look at the maps, the critical habitat maps, which will show um, where roughly where, where the SOD hasn't been found, but where the habitat, and usually it's based around where they, they've been found historically, or well, or find, found recently. Uh I have another question. Um, is skunk cabbage a native species to BC? Yes. That is. You see yeah. it everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, and um, another question we have here is who is on the invasive species committee and what support are they getting from the government? Who's on, on the... The invasive species okay. committee. Um, I don't know if this is for um, a Metro Vancouver or a BC because I know you've got a, a few different... Uh, uh, invasive species councils. I, I, I'm not sure. Maybe um, that was Michael. Maybe if you oh, who, who's sitting on our on the SCCP steering yeah. committee? Yeah, um, yeah. We have both Rep, uh, Tasha um, from the Metro Vancouver uh, and uh, Kathy Ma uh, Green from the Fraser Valley are sort of our two main contacts. So I guess who are like who is that committee those councils comprised of? So who are the the, the people that are are on those different councils? And on, the one, on, yeah. Oh, or we mean with the invasive species councils? I guess the invasive I, species I council. I don't yeah. know. Maybe we'll answer that. Yeah. And we'll see if that answers the question. And if it doesn't, then uh, Michael, you can you know ask for further clarification. I mean, because I know you've got the invasive species of council of Metro Vancouver. So what kind of representation is it? It's just different organizations and different, you know, from government and uh, nonprofits. Yeah. So for the, about for the steering committee for the, yeah, the SCCP 
um, yeah, sort of it, it's a range of like, like uh, our chair is John, Dr. John Richardson at UBC, um, like the Fraser Valley Conservancy is involved, um, the Invasive Species Council, Fraser Valley uh, Watershed Society, it's the whole range of, of groups. Um, but uh, we're, but we're, we're just we're a partnership group, so we don't meet that often. Um, and we don't actually have any staff. We're not a charity, we're not a society. Um, and I, yeah, so it's, it's uh, we just get together to share information and, and discuss various topics. And sometimes we'll apply for grants to do various projects as well. Does anybody have any other questions? Um, I was just going to comment that uh, if people are typing in, um, if you have any questions, uh, yeah, we have um, both in Campbell Valley and in Derby Reach where the Western Toes crossing the road. So Campbell Valley across 200th, um, we have those new wetlands that were created just north of 16th and they cross the road there. And I know at Derby Reach, um, you know, crossing Allard Crescent and those are both two sort of problem areas um mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's that's a, it's a challenge um i mean that's why they in the it, the chilliwack one the tunnel it's in the rider lake area and we studied uh because it with the community brought it to the conservancy's attention quite a few years ago um it took a few years of studying and and kind of figuring out okay if we were to put it in the tunnel where where should it go um and the, they don't always uh cross the same spot always they <laughs> are unpredictable but um, it, it has worked and we, we put up directional fencing uh, every year as well to help direct them towards to go under the tunnel too. But, but building that is not easy, it's not cheap. Um, yeah. And certainly one thing we've done too in that area, I don't know if that's feasible where you're talking about, but is we do recommend people take detours uh, until, because the migration only lasts a couple weeks. Uh, you know, it's yeah, not no. that long. So if people don't mind going a little bit out of their way, um, that's always a good thing too. So just for you, for people, um, you know, if you want more information about Pacific Parklands Foundation, um, that's the website there, Metro Vancouver, uh, metrovancouver.org, you can go there. And of course, um, Tansman already shared um, the website for the South Coast Conservation. So thanks everybody for joining us today. And thank you Tamsin for an awesome uh, presentation that was really informative and some really good ideas there um, for what we can do in our own backyard. And, um, and also, yeah, thanks to Pacific Parklands Foundation for sponsoring and hosting this series of webinars at the Nature House. We really appreciate that. I um, wanna thank you everybody for uh, joining us today. Enjoy the rest of the day. It's, it's sort of sunny where I am. And uh, yeah, just enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks again, bye-bye.